first speaker, Sister Maureen. Sister Maureen Opeke is originally from Nigeria and she belongs to the religious order of the Missionary Sisters of Our Lady of the Holy Rosary. And they're celebrating the centenary of their foundation this year. Sister Maureen has been a Catholic nun for 33 years and she's also a medical doctor and a counsellor and she holds a master's degree in public health from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. She is currently studying mental health to become a therapist. As a missionary and a doctor, most of her work has been in resource poor areas of Africa, such as Nigeria, Kenya and Cameroon. The areas of her apostolate include, but are not limited to, general and family medicine, maternal and child health services, community medicine, with infectious diseases such as HIV and AIDS, and she's been well known um, for her advocacy and mentorship. She's a great speaker and a valued advocate for equity and education. Her religious inclination is to bless the Blessed Virgin Mary through the Rosary, the Legion of Mary, and adoration of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. And Sister Maureen's topic today is the fight for life, a safe motherhood journey. So please welcome Sister Maureen. The first time I attended, he's a professor of gynecology and the obstetrics. So the first time I attended uh, what they call, you know, validatory uh, tour speech, that's what he said. Because in, the, in school, we nicknamed him Lebel. Because that's what he taught. Women, Lebel, and childbirth. How do you get a woman to a safe childbirth? How do we have a life mother and a life baby? So it just stuck me. That was like something years ago, but it stuck that they may live and enjoy the fruits of their labor. This is what God said to us in the Bible. But Professor Rosanye directed it to the women in labor because that's where he lived his life. May he so rest in peace. Amen. He's God now. So the topic for my God is the, the fight for life is journey to safe motherhood. In all my years of working as a doctor in parts of Africa, that's our struggle. That women, that no woman dies in labor or childbirth. But it still happens and it's still happening. So that's my cry. That they may live and enjoy the fruits of their labor. Motherhood or childbearing is one of the outstanding attributes of women, womanhood in my cultural setting. The society expects the woman to bear children of both sexes. If you have only female children, that creates its own problem too. Have only male children, it has its own problems as well. So the male children keep the family lineage in perpetuity, while the females are expected to get married and bear children in the family they are married into. Childlessness breeds stigma and discrimination from the community, especially for the woman, since she's the child bearer. Thus, 
Every woman desires to fulfill these vital societal expectations to prove her relevance and fullness of womanhood in the community. So, I had an experience of when I was working in Otto Mission Hospital, Kitale, in Kenya. Thank you for welcoming me to your country. She's from Kenya. So, uh, I had the experience of having two women that needed emergency urgent cesarean section. And I was the only little doctor. I was just fresh in the profession. So, so I, that brings the question, the woman or the baby? So when I ask this question, the woman or the baby, people go like, oh, if the woman and the baby belong together, I mean, what's the question? But this one, the woman belong differently, the baby belong differently. I was put in a situation that I have to save two women's life and a baby's life. So, that's the story. So, welcome to my story. So, the story of how a young daughter of two years experience took two women into the theatre at the same time for emergency cesarean section. It happened in Otto Mission Hospital, Rift Valley District, Kenya, where I was sent by my religious order to serve as a missionary as my medical doctor. Though the country and setting were different from mine, the cultural expectations and burden of childbearing for women is very the same with mine, where I come from. I'm from Nigeria, but this happened in Kenya. It's in Africa. We are the same. <laughs> so, so it was about 12.30 a.m. in the middle of the night when I was awakened by the sounds of the heavy footsteps marching across the footpath from the sisters coming to the hospital. Usually, you know, the, the convent, I stay in the convent close to the hospital. It's the mission hospital, so it was established by my congregation. So usually in the middle of the night, each time I hear footsteps like the hoofs of large cows or horses, I don't need to, anybody to come and wake me up. I'll just wake up and start waiting for the intercom from the hospital to buzz near my room. So the moment I hear, I hear it, so, so I quickly changed into my hospital wares, grabbed a cup of strong coffee to keep my eyes open and maybe my mind alight. So my ears opened to the buzz from the intercom. That was the only means of emergency communication between the hospital and the doctor's residence and the convent at the time. Other telecommunication devices were not yet available made even now not really available. So the intercom finally burst. When I picked up the panicky voice of the nurse on duty came across. Dactari, Dactari, Dactari means doctor. Dactari, Dactari, we have an emergency. And my usual response is get ready for the theater. I don't usually ask what is it? Because that was the usual thing when a woman is in labor. You wouldn't come to the hospital. You just just no antenatal anyway. So in our two, you know our two. So it's far where the people live in the community is far from the city center where there is the church, the school, the market, the hospital, the convent. Everything is just in the community center. So usually when I ask them, please, where is your house? Can I come and visit you? And they're all like, Ndio. Ndio means yes. So they will say, um, I will say, how far is your house? And they will do. I will say, no. Means the number of hills I have to climb and descend. And before I finish climbing, 30 minutes, one hour, I have not finished climbing and descending. Yeah. So they will do. <laughs> then you to get to the third one. I'll be like, hmm, I'm not sure I'll be able to do that. <laughs> so usually when a woman is in labor, there are no hospitals. Uh, around except uh, the auto mission hospital. So what they do is that the woman may have tried one day, two days, three days on her own before they can bring in the traditional birth attendant. And if uh, the woman it was not able to uh, she was not able to deliver the baby, then just imagine the state of the mother and the baby. That's when they will be prepared to bring the woman to the hospital for me, because you are that time, you said bring them, so we bring them to you. <laughs> so, there are no vehicles, there are no cars, there's nothing to bring the woman. So what they do is that the men in the community, 
they will all come out together. That's a beautiful thing. So they will make a stretcher with sticks and bamboo and tie them together. The woman lies down and they tie the woman there and every man to have come carrying her on the head. So well, that's the first step I used to hear when they were bringing her to the hospital. When one group gets tired, they hand over to the next group. So that's what usually wakes me up. Once I hear, imagine 12 men stamping. And then I don't need to tell the door to wake up. I just jump up and wait, they keep waiting for the intercom. So that's what happened to me. So I got down the last drop of coffee and dashed down to the hospital along the footpath, not forgetting to grab my torch. Because the night is a bit dark, there was no electricity anyway. That's not many years ago, about 12, 13 years ago. No electricity, so I had to go with my touch. Because they are creeping things and snakes that... That's their time to come out and look for their food, so I can actually come out to disturb them. So when I go, I have to get my touch and make sure I leave them to pass. Sometimes I meet the snake, I'm like, okay, sorry, you pass before I pass. I don't want to be beaten by snakes. I'm afraid of snakes. We will be in fear of snakes. We have. So, the pregnant woman, this time, the names here, the story is real, but the names are not. The pregnant woman, Sarah, was being untied and lifted from the makeshift stretcher, which was used by the community to bring her to the hospital. At that instant, Kepra, not his real name, was our cook from the convent. He cooks for us. So, he came out trembling, he came out from among the men. I, you know, like, well, I was shocked. Like, Kepra, what are you doing here? He said, Sarah is my wife. I was utterly shocked. I didn't know the wife was pregnant, and none of the sisters, all the other sisters in the convent, were all medical people, they were all nurses. Nobody knew the wife was pregnant. He didn't tell any of us. His reason, because the wife already had two cesarean sections. And it's always taken that the doctor made the wrong choice by doing the cesarean section. So the next pregnancy, the woman will be meant to deliver naturally because that's what you make her a full woman. She has years, she's not yet a full woman, she just can't even push a baby. She has to be held in the hospital. So that's a bad woman. So, and that's why she, he didn't tell us that the wife was pregnant because he knew that we would keep nagging and then to bring her to the hospital for another cesarean section. But he didn't want that. So, until he got to this stage again. So when I came and then, so I didn't know what to do. I'm like, oh, what are you doing? I said, Sarah is my wife. Oh, this time there was no time to start scolding him or blaming him for anything. I'm like, okay, we go to the theater. And I had taken time to explain that, you know, this has to be done right now because there's imagine there's no inside, there's no argument, no room for argument, no room for trial. Because on examining the woman, the abdomen was already tense and there was imminent rupture, signs of imminent rupture of the uterus. If I let it go on, the uterus will rupture the next minute. And what happens? The baby actually will die and I wasn't sure how to handle the woman. This was in the middle of the night and I was the only little doctor. I had no assistant, I had no qualified nurses. The ones that used to assist me are the nurse and the aides we train in the hospital. So my assistant, uh, Dr. Mayo, then, he lived, um, he lived in Edward, he lived in Edward from autumn to Edward. It's like three hours away and he comes three days a week and goes back. So most of the time, he's just a little maid I'm in the hospital. So, so that's what happened. So, so every woman desired to have natural birth and hoped that the doctors would be proved wrong for advising a cesarean section. They could give up their lives in a bid to have natural birth, and many did. So, as Sarah was being wheeled into the operating room, I heard someone shouting, Dantari, Dantari! So when I looked back, I saw another group of people bringing another woman, it's every night, into the hospital. Who? This time, the woman was just pouring blood from her private children. Blood was just uh, I mean, just before I entered, I just stopped short. I'm like, what am I going to do? It's like, why? I mean, like, that, you, you just so, you don't know what to do, but everybody looking at you to tell them what to do. 
What do we do? I mean, everybody, that's a question. So, so this woman's name was Lindy, it's not her name. So on examination, Lindy was in shock. She was in shock. She had ruptured placenta previa, and the baby had died. Though still in her womb, and she was at the verge of passing out. So, I was the only doctor on duty since my second came for three days a week and lived four hours away. It would take the hospital vehicle about two hours to get to the next hospital if you were to refer one of the women to the hospital. Under the circumstances, considering all of these things, it might take about six hours for any of the women to get help in the other hospital. But the truth, actually, the hunt is that none of them will go. Even if I say go, they won't go. They've just reached me. I am the God. We can't come to God and God say go somewhere else. It's not possible. You have that experience. They, once they reach my hospital, that's it. We've come. So there's nobody, nowhere else will tell us go and we'll go. Even if I had anything. So, so I found myself in an extremely tight corner. What happened next? <laughs> no one was ever prepared for such emergencies. And least of me. So at that moment, I kept hearing the voices within me challenging me, send the three lives. One was gone. I had three. I had to send them. And I was like, you need to send them. You need to send the three lives. But like how? So all my attention was, all attention was on me. I could hear the unspoken question in the minds of the people around amidst the deafening silence. One staff was courageous enough to ask, Doctor, what do we do? Who do we handle first? Can anybody tell me who did I handle first? <laughs> yes. The lady in shock. The lady in shock. Yeah. Why did you say that? Why? I thought that maybe might be more urgent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Definitely, yes, yeah, she was. Yeah. But I was at a fix. I had told the other woman, is our cook. He, he came first and has said, this baby must come out now, otherwise he dies. And now I was going into the teeth and another one comes. If I leave him, I leave them, the first group, and take this one and that baby dies. How was I supposed to come to it? That was what I was like. How am I supposed to? How would I explain to him, you can first, I told you your baby was dying, and you were like, oh, data, please, fast. And now another woman comes and he the baby to die and put the woman in the problem. So that was the problem. You are correct, but that was the tight corner I was in. So, so you know what I said? I said, bring both of them into the operating room, was my response. As I said, bring the two in. Just get them in. So <laughs> first woman will in, second woman will in. And I just said, close the theater door and zip your mouth. <laughs> That's what I told you, not because otherwise if the, anybody goes and say, oh, who is she handling first? That would be a problem. And like, the door and then? So, so that's how we started. So the staff were all wide eyed and brought the two women to the theater. So inside the operating room. The question remained, who do I handle first? Who get the preference? Both of them, but none of them. So I was stayed on selling those prayer lights. Note, I had no anesthetics, and I had no pediatrician, and I had no qualified nurse, no RN, nothing. It was just me. So, and that's the situation I worked in. So, I usually get assistance for anything to assist my surgery from those uh, uh, girls we train as uh, nurse assistants in the hospital. So, we train them on the job, so that the one that do everything with me. Don't be just have to go to do and do it. So, that's what they do for me. So, what I have on was the first woman, Sarah. I kept her in the preparatory room and set up the drip and gave antibiotics because she'd been in level for two, three days. Thank God the babies, the baby was still alive, everything fine. So I kept her in a corner and put a, uh, excuse me, one of the nurses, I said, stay with her, monitor her, her BP, monitor her pulse, and you know what we used to do, the baby said, and then we count. So I said, you know how to do it, so just keep doing that. And any change, just shout at me. 
So, so you kept doing it, and the woman, oh, okay, your baby is okay, you'll be fine, the baby will be fine. But the other woman, uh, you are much better off, please let me handle her first. And you're like, okay. So, so I kept her, but everybody was inside the table. I said, and nobody should go out, and nobody should open mouths. So, two of them we were there, we were all, all, all of us inside. So, a lot of those students they came in to help because I needed a lot of help that night. So, I, um, the baby mother being monitored, I put the other one inside immediately and set up the saline to boost her. She was a shock, take off her baby. And I had lots of blood supply. Uh, yeah, you usually have lots of uh, no blood supply for transfusion from the district hospital, from the central blood hospital. The, any, any amount I ask, they usually give me. It's controlled by the government. It was beautiful. That saved me lots of trouble. So because they know I live very far and the kind of situations I handle, so any time I come, I, at time I come and make requests, they give me 20 pints, 30 pints. They just give me whatever I want. I get preference for that because I live far and my situations are usually horrible. So I had, I said from the lab, give me three pints of blood, group and cost three pints of blood and bring to the theater. But I don't usually give those blood because if I give, they bleed out. So I put the fluid, the water, my mouth, and, <laughs> and then when her situation was, you know, she came up a bit, her BP up a bit. So I go out, scrub, come and give the anesthetics. I use spinal anesthesia anyway. So I give the spinal anesthesia <laughs> and kept monitoring. And then, you know how doctors, <laughs> I go out again, remove all this one stuff, another scrubbing, another gloss, and come in. Now the surgeon so did the first surgery. I mean, uh, at that moment, let me tell you, I kind of I felt, you know, you left your body. You're not just your body. That's what I felt was happening. But I didn't realize. Like, I could, I, I may have left my body doing these things because it is not normal. It's not what a normal human being does. So, to just be that monitoring and using my brain and my just two hands, I wish I had six then. So, but I had only two. So, that's what happened. Uh, Finished the first surgery, opened, brought out the placenta, the baby was already gone. So I brought out the baby, always baptized. Then the name of the bishop, he's an Irish bishop, Maurice Glory. If I, if I bring a still bed, a, a boy, Maurice, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I don't care whether you go to church or you don't go to church. It's not my business. I go to church, I baptize you in my faith. If he's a girl, Maureen, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So I baptized every baby. Every baby boy is Maureen's. Oh, I, I remember Pope. Oh, which Pope is it? Oh, Pope John Paul is second. John Paul, I baptize you in the name of the Father. <laughs> so, so I baptized. Sometimes I'll ask the students around, does anybody want the name? <laughs> because the baby is dead. They no, no, no. They don't agree for their name. So I keep, because my name is the one that comes to my head. So I just baptize my name. Maureen, I baptize you. I don't know everybody will be Maureen. I said, I have nothing else to do. I don't know whose name to use. So the one that comes with the Pope, the Bishop, either the parish priest, or any of the Reverend Sisters. After I say, oh, I know I had a baby last night. The baby passed and I is your name. So I baptize the baby. <laughs> so you have one. So I baptize that one. And uh, God so kind, uh, you know, uterus, uh, sutured, bleeding, for everything. Then I start blood transfusion. So when I finish with the first one, whew, I'm like, I'm not breathing yet because each time I had to shout, Hello, how is the vita? How is the blood pressure? What is the pulse? And each, you know, response of, you know, it's within normal range, you know, didn't ask a shot of relief first. Especially the baby, I always shout, how is the fit I had? Oh, it is 120. I'll be like, oh, please keep it at that until I get through to the baby. So when I finished the first woman and uh, cleaned everything, clothes came out of it. Shall we take out of the thing? I'm like, no, you're going to put me in trouble. Leave her there and bring the other one. So quickly, you know, all the mess we made, just quick, quick, quick a clean up for everything. And uh, I get back to the Preparation room, the same procedure happens again. Bring this one, give spinal anesthesia, get out, dress, and come and do the surgery. 
So when I, I was about to open, I had to be sure the baby was still alive myself. So when I still, <laughs> so I opened up, when I opened the abdomen, the, the uterus was already opening and looking at me. The baby was like, <laughs> yeah, the uterus was already opening. Get me. So I just, you know, I did have to use a knife and I just used my hand and did like this and grab my baby. So when I grabbed the baby, cried, wah, 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 wah. wow, that's the most beautiful sound in the whole world. The cry of a baby in a theater. I always say, I say for me, a doctor, the most beautiful sound I ever heard. Is the cry of a baby in the theater. Because that when you are going to theater, you're just this anxiety. Will this baby come out alive and well and good? So each time a baby cries, I'll go like, yeah! <laughs> so, so when I so when I opened, okay, that's it. So when I finish, I fixed everything, you know, you draws closed. Once I had no bleeding again. One of the nurses they was I mean I had spoken one then Helen said, Doctor, you are not singing and dancing. <laughs> because that's my theatre routine. Sing and dance in the theatre. And uh, I know only one kiss while thing I used to sing. It's part of the mass. It says Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. I just love the way they sing it in Kiswahili. And the losses already know. Once I start that, they know there's no more danger. Because I'll start, please do a make a please do a make a please do a taru di tena. You know that? Good. So they know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, it just means Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. I just love it. So once they see me singing, they're like, oh, whew, they just start breathing. I just start, I just start it. Christo Amego Fa, Christo Amego Go Fa, Christo Ataru Di Tena. And the, the, the nurse is like, oh, wow. So, so finally, I read a sigh of relief. It's like, oh. So I had three lives on earth and one in heaven. The steward was a boy and I baptized him after Morris, crowning the bishop of the diocese. So it was a great sight when the two women and the life baby were wheeled out of the operating room at the same time with the doctor beaming. <laughs> so the families could not decipher what happened in the theater. The mother first or the baby first? So that's my story. Tell on my soul the greatness of his name. Make known his might, they this his arm has done. His mercy strong, promise to age the same. His holy name, the Lord, the mighty one.